as uh, was mentioned in the introduction, I'm going to be speaking today about a novel uh, and its implications for the global city, Metro Manila, uh, and understanding the historical role of this city as it has been vividly realized in a mid 20th century novel. Uh, I have to be uh, open at the front and say this is very much a side project, although a long time uh, in a literary weekly uh, sort of newsprint with a glossy cover called Liwaiwai, which was widely circulated in the Philippines uh, in the period leading up to the imposition of military dictatorship in 1972. This became, in retrospect, one of the key novels of this post-war to military dictatorship period of 1946 to 72. It was subsequently turned into a very significant film, one of the more important films in Philippine cinematography, Mainila sa mga kuko ng liwanag, which came out in 1975. Uh, the film has modified the title slightly. It is no longer in the Claws of Light. It is Manila in the Claws of Light, thus asserting in the title of the film the centrality of the city, which is a key aspect of the argument that I'm going to be making. The serialized text, which had become a film, was finally made available as a published novel in 1986 after the overthrow of Ferdinand Marcos and the reopening of democracy in the Philippines. I'm interested in this talk, both in the historical significance of the work, uh, so not simply its literary worth, which I think I'm going to defend, uh, I'm gonna defend, but not only that, what does the work mean for uh, historians trying to understand mid 20th century Philippines? Problems posed by its translation. And what is the significance of translating a specific text of a specific global, history, uh, global city for our understanding of the literature of global cities? And I will be dealing with the task of translating a Tagalog text into English. Um, Edgardo Imrea's novel of an aberration in mid 20th century Filipino literature in that it deals with urban life and particularly working class life. Uh, the majority of major works of Filipino literature uh, are another, rural in their focus through about 1970. Uh, and Reyes precedes that by coming up with one of the very first truly urban novels, uh, not only a novel of work increased by a working class author, a point that I'll highlight in just a moment. The novel is thus a valuable and largely unused historical source for understanding the lived character of Metro Manila in the mid 20th. The, the novel and at its center, the city, vividly depicts the combined and uneven development of global capitalism. That is to say that it is part of a combined Losing an even result, uh, not only globally, but locally, the results are markedly uneven. And it depicts Manila as a formative global city, transitioning to a globalized metropolis. The literary embodiment, however, of this through its protagonists and their whereabouts, etc., is necessarily concrete. Uh, this is not not an examination of the creation of uh, a global city and its formation, but a literary depiction of that. And thus, the cosmopolitanism of Greater Manila, linguistic and temporal specificity. That is to say, it is 1965 Tagalog in a particular, a particular time, a particular language. Um, and the challenges the task for the translator is to draw out the relationship between the universal, the global city and its formation, and the particular, the specificities of the novel and of uh, urban proletarian life in Metro Manila, to allow the specific to live on the page for a new reading audience without reifying this experience uh, as something alien or, or love of untranslated italics thus taking some words from Tagalog and just leaving them for the English reading public in untranslated italics to give a sense of false familiarity. So these are the challenges. This is significant, but translating it is difficult, rendering the specific and the universal in an intelligible fashion. The 
my notes. There we go. Serialization in 1966 67 occurred in the context of post war democracy. Manila had been devastated by the Second World War. The Metro Manila is a composite of Quiapo, Tondo, uh, Binondo, Sampaloc, etc., uh, all of which come together to comprise Metro Manila. And beyond that, the great conurbation known as Greater Manila, which now has a 5.7 million people. Manila had been devastated by the Second World War. The entire northern bank of the Pasig River had been burned to the ground, and Intramuros, the thickly walled harbor city of the been reduced to rubble. Profit can be minted from catastrophe, and in the haphazard rebuilding of the once magnificent city, fortunes were to be made. What most dramatically transformed the post-war Philippines was a massive influx of American capitalists at parity rights with Filipinos in the ownership of property in the formerly independent country. During the Japanese occupation, the old landed families who fashioned themselves as dons and donas, hearkening back to the Spanish, who owned land of coffee and tobacco and sugar, resettled in Manila or left the country entirely. At the end of the war, many did not return to their haciendas, their plantations. The next generation of hacenderos in Western universities ruled their landed holdings through administrators. Capitalist forms of exploitation were implemented throughout the countryside, and the traditional patron-client ties of landlord and peasant were increasingly supplanted by the cold cash nexus of wage labor and ground rent. This new generation of elite turned its focus to the fashioning of business empires on a national scale, who organized themselves into a powerful political bloc. It was not just the rich, however, who were moving to the capital. A vast migration of peasant farmers over the space of the next two decades, its surrounding region where from their disembarkation at the train station of Tutuban, they spread out in the growing outskirts of the city and formed the ranks of the rapidly growing working class. The growth of Greater Manila covered large portions of Bulacan, Cavite, and Rizal. The surrounding provinces became part engulfed within the city. By the time President Macapagal took office in 1962, war boundaries to engulf 13 adjacent towns and its population increased fourfold to 2.4 million people. The swelling metropolis for a dramatic growth in number of youth at university and of our author uh, was this experience, most of whom went to privately owned for-profit institutions run by the sugar families, the coffee families, etc. The dense yet sprawling city of Manila was the center of political the Second World War to the Declaration of Martial Law from 1946 to 1972. It was largely in Manila that the country's political battles were waged. The city was marked by the combined and uneven development of global Motors, the largest General Motors assembly plant outside the United States, was based in Manila. The vast factories of U.S. tobacco produced cigarettes and cigars made from a mixture of Ilocano and Virginia tobacco of all sorts were peddled in the glossy pages of weekly magazines and from the massive billboards of Carriedo Street. This frenetic world of global trade, and this is what I think the novel depicts so vividly, with the mud and narrow stalls of the wet market and the shanty lined esteros and esquinitas that lined the city. Tens of thousands of people, but a few years removed from a life dick, now took up inventive forms of employment and became barkers for jeepney routes and carried goods in the market or pushed makeshift carts through the streets collecting and reselling scrap. This then is the world, more vividly than any other work of literature, brings to a reading audience. It is exclusively, however, a Tagalog reading audience as the novel has not been translated. Uh, well, I'm Japanese, but I have not been able to get my hands on a copy, nor could I read it if I could. I'll get to the niceties of the translation of this novel in a bit. The novel was then made into a film in 1975, The Military Dictatorship. The basic economic questions that I just outlined were the same, but the political character of the Philippines was markedly transformed to one of repression, torture, 
dictatorship. And then finally, in 1986, it was published as a book, a setting that I'm not going to dedicate much attention to in this presentation. Edgardo Imreyas, the author of Samaku Liwanag, was born in 1936, lived as a child through the occupation and subsequent post-colonial, post-independence period, uh, and came to uh, literary awareness, to developing himself as an author, while he was working as a construction worker and going to university part-time. He was a manual worker at the construction worker sites. He was not a skilled worker. He was what is known as a peon or peon. Um, and was responsible for carrying goods and so on and so forth. But he went to night school at one of the schools in the university belt. Uh, they were routinely referred to as diploma mills because they churned out graduates on an extraordinary scale. Um, but he discovered that he had a knack for writing and turned to expand his income by writing the papers of his fellow students for pay. They would pay him and he would produce their final projects and so on and so forth. Uh, and he found that he did it so well that he could guarantee A's to anyone who paid him for a paper. In fact, he recounts in a small biographical uh, interview that was conducted with him, I think, in the 1990s, that uh, at one point, a teacher took him aside and accused him of plagiarism for his own paper. She said that his paper was too good to have been written by a person such as him, by which she meant a construction worker. Uh, and he was furious at her, not simply because he was being falsely accused of plagiarism, but because many of his classmates were receiving A's for work that he had himself written, while he was being accused of plagiarism, not because of the character of his writing, but because of his class background. His literary breakthrough, according to his own account, came when he stumbled across a World War II GI library edition, something printed for American soldiers during the Second World War, of a collection of short stories by Ernest Hemingway. And he read uh, some of the Nick Adams stories, who's a key protagonist in many of Hemingway's short stories. And it was there in Hemingway's text in a way that he never spells out. You're left with this sort of tantalizing idea that he does in reading Hemingway. But nonetheless, the sort of vivid, lived, working class, concrete language that Hemingway exemplified in his short stories were what inspired the writing of Reyes in his Tagalog writing. Unable to continue to sustain himself in the city, he was compelled to move out of the city for a time, but began writing articles uh, of uh, fictional prose and submitting them to various papers and was gradually published. And the, this then was the origin of his first novella serialized uh, in Liwaiwai, which became Samakukonam Niwanak. The novel itself is the story of a protagonist, Julio Madiaga. Uh, the names of the characters, as I'll get to in a moment, all of them have a somewhat allegorical and, I would argue, forced character to them. The characters, however, live beyond, I think, their archetypal uh, naming. Julio Madiaga, for example, his name means perseverance, uh, or dedication, or hard work. Uh, uh, Julio Madiaga is a construction worker when we first meet him, but he's new on the job site. Uh, and as we become aware of his backstory, we realize that he's just arrived in the city from the countryside, as a great many people have at this point. And he's on an odyssey. He has come to the city to find his love, Ligaya. Um, because Ligaya, his betrothed, left the city with a, a job recruiter named Mrs. Cruz, who came to their village and promised high wages and so on if she would come to the city for some employment, I believe, in a garment factory. Um, and then he never heard from her again. So he's arrived in the city to try and find her, but this is immensely difficult in a city of two and a half million people. So his odyssey takes us through the city in a very vivid, detailed, and geographically specific and accurate fashion. First from his job site, then to the various shanty line desteros, the sewage canals that line the city, through the gambling facilities with their gleaming lights, and then finally to Chinatown. Along the way, we meet people who are suffering from tuberculosis or lining up for hours to acquire potable water, etc. It's a vivid depiction of lived life from the bottom up in this growing city. He stumbles across Ligaya somewhat accidentally. Um, and discovers that when she arrived in the city, Mrs. Cruz 
sold her into forced sex slavery in a brothel, that she was there purchased by a man named Apek, a deeply problematic character, a Chinese Filipino who is the antagonist towards the end of the novel, who purchases Ligaya. Um, Ligaya and Julio uh, interact. Uh, Ligaya attempts to flee her husband slash owner uh, and in the process is killed. He had been beating her. She was difficult for her to leave because she had a child and so she had to go back for the child. Julio finds and kills Atec, stabbing him to death. He is then pursued by a mob of angry Filipinos. Uh, and the novel concludes, the final paragraph concludes, as Julio is about to be beaten to death. It's a rather grim ending. Now, there's a, a peculiar character to much of Philippine literature. I'm not an expert on the translation of world literatures, but it is marked that a great deal of truly world significant literature remains untranslated. In fact, all of Tagalog literature, really. Banag at Sikat, Mga Ibong Mandaragit, Luha ng Buwaya, a number of novels of really immense significance remain untranslated. This is an example. Unfortunately, my talk about translating this novel has a somewhat hypothetical character because the family has asserted property rights over the novel and refused to allow it to be translated into English for reasons that I don't fully understand. Uh, they have not been specified. The difficulties posed in translating the novel are numerous, and they reflect largely the process of translating any specific work about a specific global city. One is that it is concrete and detailed, not only linguistically concrete, that is to say it has the specific language of Tagalog workers, it is also temporally concrete. That is to say it is Manila not of the present, but of 1965. And thus for the reading public, one feels that there is a great deal that needs to be brought up to date. Uh, the geography of the city, etc., needs to be made part of the novel for the new reader. Now, one can do this through a scholarly apparatus and outworkings, but the more that you weigh down your scholarly outworkings, the less it feels like a novel, the less it feels like the lived reality of a protagonist, and the more it feels like uh, a scholarly text, which is what, as a translator, we're somewhat trying to avoid. Uh, there was a great renaming that took place in the Philippines from the mid-1960s through the 1970s. Uh, street names were changed everywhere into modern Filipino political names, and thus all of the street names of the novel, they don't exist any longer, with a few exceptions. All of the names of Spanish colonialism were pasted over with the names of new nationalist political figures in the Philippines. Thus, the city has the street of Azcaraga changed into the street of Recto. But the street Taft, named after William Howard Taft, the American governor general and future president of the United States, that's still named Taft. There is a politics to the choice of renaming. But there is a question in translating, how does one bring up to date and make vivid what is in fact quite vivid in the novel. But even for a modern reading Filipino public, this doesn't feel like the city of Manila any longer. There is also the question of the relationship between the city and the countryside, which I think in any novel dealing with the growth of a global city, the fact that it is emerging out of and coming to dominate over its rural surroundings, particularly in the so-called third world, uh, is a critical question. And I think that this receives its most vivid literary embodiment in the question of accents, because everyone in this city on the job site has come from a different province. None of them, really, are indigenous to Manila for several generations. All of them come from Bicol or Tarlac, uh, etc. They come from various provinces, and every one of them thus speaks a somewhat accented Tagalog. How do you translate that? Uh, do you try to find correlates in the English language and give them Cockney or Georgian accents or something like that? I think that would feel forced and ridiculous. Do you construct accents that can somehow resemble this? Uh, or is it in the process of transliterating? And this is the choice that I took. Is it in the process of transliterating, leaving untranslated certain phrases that are intelligible, like the word Manila, which is pronounced Mainila by some, including myself, and menila by others and so on, and thus giving a marker for their various backgrounds. Uh, it's not a particularly elegant solution, but I think it works. I'll give one more aspect of translation, the marvelous opening passage from our novel. Uh, 
Um, it deals with the creation of a building. Um, and Reyes writes, in the beginning, this construction was a skeleton struggling in the air, a towering loose heap of thrown off pieces of rotten wood, worm ridden, split, splintered, twisted, cubiform, nailed, standing, jutting, crossing, senselessly cobbled together like chicken scratches in the dirt. And here will joint the steel, ribs, galvanized iron, plywood, and particle board to catch the turbidly flowing mixture of water, gravel, sand, and cement, and the pulped material will squeeze into and overfill the mold, dry, harden, embrace the steel, ribs, and the pipe intestines. Every pore of pulped material is added flesh to its body, an added line to the intended figure. The skeleton of wood will slowly be swept away as the concrete body slowly widens and rises. It will be polished, dressed in glass, tile, marble, and formica, face washed with color to pretty its skin. And at its complete birth, it will be christened and its name engraved in bronze. In the beginning, it was a skeleton struggling in the air. It will be enriched, fattened, and given health by the watering of sweat and blood. And it will stand in perfect stability strength and sturdiness, erect and towering in power, while at its feet are, and prostrate, collapsed, wounded, bloody, faces turned upwards to its height, the ones who shoveled it. In the beginning, it was a pathetic skeleton. In the end, a powerful, arrogant god. Now, I apologize, you don't have the text in front of you, and I read somewhat quickly. What I've tried to do in this translation is capture the fact that the opening paragraph in particular has in the Tagalog a very jagged, uh, almost fits and starts sort of character to it, as it mirrors the scaffolding and erection of this building, which is transformed from a skeleton into a body. And then in the second two paragraphs, from a skeleton to a body into a god that dominates over those who built it. There are obviously shades here of both Feuerbach and Marx. The idea that we have impoverished ourselves by projecting all that is noble within us, love and compassion and so on, onto an imagined being, God, and impoverished ourselves of these things, leaving us only with original sin, etc. And thus the Marxian notion of alienation, that by our labor we have been alienated from our product, and that these workers now have created a God that towers over them while they are bloody and prostrate, etc., at its feet. This finds particular expression, and the reason I went through this is the translation of a homonym, uh, a word that reads the same in Tagalog and could be two possible words in English. The word nagpala. Uh, it's, I translated this as faces turned upwards to its height, the ones who shoveled it, shoveled the building, constructed the building. Because pala simultaneously means shovel and bless. It is a very workaday word bound up with construction and bound up with religion. How does one translate that when clearly both are at play here? The act of construction is the act of creating a God who dominates you. Both are present within this word. Now, I don't want to assert the untranslatability of the text, but rather that the task of the translator requires a certain outworking, unfortunately, a certain weighing down to convey the niceties. It will lose some of its poetics in the process. There has already, however, been at least one translation, not a translation from Tagalog into English, but a translation from novel into cinema. In 1975, the novel was turned into a vividly realized film, uh, which was recently released by Criterion Collection in 2018. So you can get your hands on it, and I would encourage you to see it. It was produced by the famed Filipino director, Lino Broca. Uh, the script was written by the famed scriptwriter writer, Eduardo del Mundo, and the cinematography by the emerging director, Mike De Leon. This is a trifecta. Uh, rarely do you have such a conglomeration of talent brought together. And it vividly realizes the city. The film, however, tends more towards the allegorical and the archetypal. The cinematography captures elegantly exactly what I think Reyes was aiming for. But the narrative has been rewritten further to highlight the fact that there is a sort of the archetypal character of Ligaya, the woman who is sold into slavery and then dies, comes to represent the countryside, contaminated by the city. We have visions of the countryside in flashback that we never get in the novel. 
And the countryside is not a, sit, a place of rural poverty, but of pristine beaches and so on and so forth. And this vision of the city as a place of contamination and the countryside as a place of refuge is not one that is present in Rea's novel. And I think it's a shortcoming of the film. There is, however, I think a significant shortcoming to the novel, and this is the concluding point that I want to make. And that is our antagonist, the figure of Atek. He is the shadowy Chinese businessman who purchases Ligaya. Atek sounds like Atik, which is the Tagalog slang for money, or it was, it's rarely used now. Um, and it isn't really a Chinese name. Uh, and it sort of represents the fact that he is also something of an archetypal figure, but he's a racialized archetypal figure in a deeply problematic way. The entire novel is an indictment of the unnamed reality of global capitalism and the mass misery that it breeds in the production of its global cities. And yet, it leaves us with an antagonist who is not at all a direct expression of this reality, a small Chinese merchant, the building whose construction I just described in quoting from the opening chapter of the novel is not being produced by a small Chinese merchant. It's being produced by a multinational corporation of some sort. Um, and the global city is not the product of small Chinese commerce. The Chinese merchants have been present throughout Southeast Asia since prior to the arrival of European colonialism and running throughout the history of European colonialism and American colonialism in the post-colonial period has been a history of anti-Semitism anti whipped up, anti-Chinese sentiment whipped up in periods of crisis. And the novel lends itself to that, unfortunately. Um, it could be argued that Reyes is attempting to depict the limitations of working class consciousness, the fact that the working class protagonist is unable to truly construe who the actual antagonists are, that it is systemic. But that argument falls short in that the narrative voice itself, the voice of Reyes, upholds this sort of racialized animosity and the depiction of Atik and his description, etc. It's unpleasant. One recalls uh, the uh, famous passage from Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. A tractor is coming to plow through the home of a sharecropper that's been dispossessed by the Dust Bowl, etc. And the sharecropper intends to shoot the man on the tractor, and the man on the tractor says, well, don't shoot me, I'm just here on the orders from the bank, and I'm paraphrasing for the interests of time. And he says, well, then I'll go to the bank, and I'll shoot the board. And he's like, well, they just got instructions from somebody back east. And he says, well, who do I shoot? I ain't going to starve to death unless I shoot somebody. And he says, well, I don't know. Maybe there's nobody to shoot. Maybe the thing isn't men at all. Maybe, like you said, the property's doing it. Anyway, I told you my orders. Now, this idea that the antagonist is somehow systemic does not, is not distilled into the artistry of Rea's novel. And thus, we wind up with an antagonist at the end who is racialized and a misrepresentation. This, despite this shortcoming, the novel is immensely significant. Um, this draws out, again, back to its historical significance, his significance for historians in understanding what mid-20th century Manila was like as an emerging global city. Marx and Engels famously wrote, workers have no country. You can't take from them what they have not got. And I think certainly from a sociological perspective, you could argue that the universalities of the experience of precarity, of migration, and so on, the experiences of the global city demonstrate that there really isn't a national aspect of this. It is a global phenomenon. But art is concrete. Literature imposes upon the translator the task of making the specificities of the work of art stand out as the necessary embodiments of the global. And thus concrete imagery, spatiality, temporality, etc., have a linguistic specificity. And it is this, this relationship between the specific, the particular, and the universal that stands at the center of the task of the translator when dealing with the global city. Thank you. I have two questions, effectively the use of literature as a historian, something I'm still very much working through myself, I'll give you my thoughts on it, and the uh, other examples of a sort of literature of global cities from a different class vantage point. In terms of using literature as a historian, I think it first of all 
I don't think that we can fully understand the historical period that we're dealing with unless we understand and are fluent with its literary depictions. Uh, these shape the thoughts of those who were at the, of the time and give a, a, a marked sense, sort of great demonstration of this particular fact. And more, this was the atmosphere of Manila and the eve of military dictatorship. And I think literature does that better than just about anything else. Uh, I would be hard pressed to find something that more vividly depicted why a social explosion was imminent and why the response of the elite to that social explosion was dictatorship. Um, so that's, that would be how I would use and how I have used this novel as a historian. Uh, in terms of the global city, its literary depiction from the vantage point of other classes, uh, it, it's odd because there is actually a wealth of literature. Well, I should, as, as a bit of background, there's an overwhelming amount of literature produced at the time that has never been published outside of its serialized form, unlike this novel. And I think that a literary historian or something along those lines could go back and unearth this. It would be a marvelous project. I'm not that familiar with all of that literature. What has been subsequently reprinted, that is to say those that were selected as the stellar examples of this literature, deal with the perspective of peasants, deal with the perspectives of the middle class and of the elite. The protagonists in each of these different novels have a different vantage point. None of them feel quite as much a global city as Rea's novel. And I think that's bound up with the class position of the workers in the city. The elite certainly are cosmopolitan in their novel, and they're constantly making references to works of Western cinema and so on and so forth. But it feels more intertextual than it does urban. It doesn't feel like it's a, an outgrowth of the global city. It feels more that they're participating in a broader exchange of ideas. Uh, that would occur regardless if they were in Paris or Manila. It doesn't feel lived, it doesn't feel specific. Um, and I think that the simultaneity of this sort of groundedness that the worker gives us on the one hand and interconnectedness on the other is what makes Reyes' novel unique. That's my take. Uh, the novels that are based from the vantage point of the peasantry in particular feel very vivid, but parochial, limited, certainly not global. Thank you very much, Joseph and Florence. Uh, by the way, I've had a couple questions pop up from Luca, but I can't read yes. them because I'm on a phone. Yes, yes, I'm going to read the question from, thank I think you. just one question, right? Um, hi, Joseph, thank you for your talk. It's super interesting. It's Luca from NTU. Could you talk a little bit the author? Was he well known in the Philippines, etc.? And could we find his novel now in English? So, yes, I can talk more about the author. Uh, Reyes was uh, unknown comparatively at the time, in the 1960s. To be serialized in Liwaiwai was, it's a, a weekly literary magazine, it was comparatively commonplace. It contained the writings of some of the greatest Filipino authors, and some whom history has entirely forgotten. And so it was a mixed bag, and Reyes could have been one of those that history forgot. But there was a layer of literati around Li Wai Wai that remembered his piece in particular. It is memorable. Uh, and that was what led to Clodoaldo del Mundo, who was an author who personally knew Reyes, writing it as a screenplay, and then Lino Broca making it into a movie. And the movie was what ensured its fame. If it had not been for Broca's movie, I am speculating, but I suspect that it would have been forgotten, tragically. And this is why I think there's probably other serialized publications of great significance that should be unearthed. But because of this film, which became an international phenomenon, uh, the, the novel was remembered. And when it was possible to publish work that was politically subversive again, 1986, the novel was printed as a novel. And then Reyes acquired a good deal more fame as a result and went on to publish other novels and other screenplays and so on. But in the early stage, he was unknown and he came from a very difficult working class background. No, the novel's not available in, in English. Uh, tragically, I've tried to make it available. I'm not the only one. I've subsequently learned that there are at least three other people that launched a translation of this work, got about halfway done like me, and then found out that the family wouldn't let us publish it even if we finished. So it's sort of sitting on a back burner for a number of us. Um, watch the movie and uh, I hope the novel will be available.